Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Helmut, for introducing me in such a kind way. And uh, thanks to the RCC for having me. It's really great to be here in Munich. And it's really great to give me the chance to discuss my work with such a high class audience. And thanks all to all to you for coming for today. So what I present you today, some rather preliminary thoughts on an environmental history of uh, sorry, uh, what I present today is some rather preliminary thoughts on an environmental history uh, of the Marshall Plan. And I came on this topic while I was doing research on the environmental history of the winter tourism industry in the Austrian Alps. And there I realized the huge importance of the Marshall Plan for the construction of transport infrastructure, which finally laid the ground for the transformation, or how I call it in my book, the acceleration of the Alps. So in my current project, I use archival holdings on the Marshall Plan from US archives to develop a better understanding of the great acceleration of Western Europe. And my presentation is organized along three parts. In the first part, I will give you some facts about the Marshall Plan, which corresponds to the textbook knowledge or the so-called established narrative. Secondly, I will argue with some examples that this knowledge is incomplete as long as historians ignore the biophysical dimension of the Marshall Plan. And the last part, and in the last part, I will try to sketch an environmental historian or socio-ecological reading of the Marshall Plan. But now let's start with the established narrative. So after World War II, large parts of Europe's infrastructure and many cities had suffered considerable damage. From 1945 to 47, U.S. economic assistance to Western Europe, mainly under the framework of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Program, the so-called UNRWA, had amounted to a staggering 9 billion U.S. dollars. And this program mostly focused on food aid and agriculture, but actually failed to, prov to provide sustainable help. The situation led U.S. Under Secretary of State for Economic Affairs, William L. Clayton, to recommend a massive injection of economic assistance to Europe after UNRWA phased out. In contrast to UNRWA, however, the assistance should be embedded in a plan that resembled New Deal measures, but went far beyond that to address the added complexity of the situation. The program was announced by George Catlett Marshall in June 1947 under the official name European Recovery Program and became later widespread known as the Marshall Plan. And within the framework of the Marshall Plan, the US put financial aid totaling 13 billion US dollars, which is about 115 US dollars at 2017 prices, into Western Europe. Officially, the plan spent three years from July 48 uh, to 51. But how were these ERP funds distributed? The so-called Economic Cooperation Agency, the ECA, was set up mainly consisting of US and European industry representatives. Countries would represent or present requests for deliveries of goods to the ECA, which evaluated and decided them according to a set scheme of priorities. The ECA purchased these goods needed from US producers. These were then distributed, with the particip participating countries being obligated to purchase the supplies in national currencies for building up so-called national counterpart funds. They were then administered by the national governments of the participating countries and distributed along so-called long-term reconstruction programs the participants developed under supervision of the ECA. By doing so, the national economic impact of the Marshall Plan was extended far beyond the direct aid injection. And what was the aim of the Marshall Plan? Primarily to modernize European industrial and business practices by using high efficiency American models, but also to reduce artificial trade barriers. And the Marshall Plan itself came with a huge technical assistance program. And the plan was considered as such a success from a contemporary perspective that George Marshall was even awarded the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in 1953. The interest in the Marshall Plan on part of the scientific community was correspondingly high. How high it was, you can see on the now following slide. So here you see the results of an evaluation of the database of Google Scholar. Altogether, at least 54,300 publications are listed at the moment. In these publications, the search term Marshall Plan is found either in the full text, 
in the title or in the abstract. Whether the Marshall Plan was centrally discussed or not in this text is in view of the large numbers of entries not really determinable. In the next step, I wanted to get an idea whether this number is high or not and put it in relation with other search terms. So here you can see the results of the comparison with, for example, the term National Socialism with 60, uh, 64,800 titles, then the German translation Nationalsozialismus with 113,000 entries, Environmental History with 220,000 entries, and the German translation to Reconstruction, the so-called Wiederaufbau, with 65,700 titles. So, so, despite all the methodological weaknesses of such an approach, these numbers show that the Marshall Plan is a subject that has already given some attention at least. But what can also be shown is that the number of the publication has been increasing since the 1970s. You can see that on the diagram. This can be explained by the fact that the archival holdings from the 1940s and 50s were released those days. But I was also interested in which combinations with other terms of uh, the Marshall Plan was used to get an idea in which disciplines the Marshall Plan was studies, studied. And here I proceeded mostly randomly and tried my hands with all sorts of search terms. The most common matches can be seen here and they are not very surprising. Number one was the USA, number two Western, number three Europe, number four Peace, number five communism and number six capitalism. So obviously the Marshall Plan is a popular topic in the history of politics, political sciences, history of diplomacy and economic history. And of course this discipline also determined which aspects of the Marshall Plan were dealt with and which were not. So maybe you might be wondering what all this has to do with environmental history. And to discuss this, I would like to invite you now to take a little tour de propaganda photography with me. The following photos all show Marshall Plan funded projects in Europe. Let's start with this from France. It shows a hydroelectric power plant under construction on the Rhone River as part of the Marshall Plan. That was the world's largest construction project underway those days. The next one is from a Dutch land reclamation project carried out with Marshall funds. Then we have a photograph of an iron mining site which was upgraded with Marshall Plan funds. Here we have a thermal power plant which was modernized. And then we have a coal mine in Norway that has been upgraded with money, with Marshall Plan money for buying machinery. And last but not least, we have a road construction project in Turkey. So the next picture is actually one of my favorites. It again shows a land reclamation project in the Netherlands staged as a before-after shot that shows how Marshall Plan money was used to literally change the face of the earth, even if it's just a very small part of the earth. And the next one is from a land reclamation project in Italy, especially the drainage of wetlands to increase crop yields in agriculture was very popular in the Marshall Plan Fund. Um, and as I said earlier, the Marshall Plan was also about technical assistance to change production practices. So let's take a look on this aspect. So we here we have a photograph that depicts Austrian engineers who visited the US to study power generators. One has to mention that Austria used a considerable part of the Marshall Plan to build up hydropower capacities in the Alps and export its surpluses to Germany. But also agriculture was about technology transfer, as you see on this photograph. Here Dutch farm boys are depicted, which travel to the US to learn more about the mechanization of farm work. This, the next one, shows Turkish farm boys and men who were taught about the advantages of tractors by, U, by a US trainer. And next we have a helicopter um, that was used to spray DDT on French fields, followed by an advertisement from the ECA that promoted the Marshall Plan fertilizer campaign to boost agricultural harvests, so to say the European variant of the Green Revolution which included not only mechanization and chemization, but also the promotion of fast-growing, high-yielding hybrid seeds, as you see on the next photograph. This, is, this picture is actually taken from the gift shop of the Marshall Plan Foundation, and it should remember that hybrid corn also found its way to Europe in the course of the Marshall Plan. 
So to sum all this up, although, must be, although one must be very aware that this is propaganda, they show one thing very clearly. The, the measures of the Marshall Plan also served to transform nature in order to provide, re to provide resources for the industrial development of Europe. And as I said in the beginning, the Marshall Plan came with the obligation that the aid was given to those in need in return for a payment in national currency, which was then collected in the counterpart funds. That's a very important point. When historians talk about the Marshall Plan, they usually talk about the period between 1948 and 52. Why is that? The counterpart funds were managed by, U by the European governments in national programs, as for example in the case of the French Monet Plan or the Italian Fondolira. Nevertheless, these funds were part of the Marshall Plan scheme, designed as such, and its, dis and the, this, its distribution was supervised by the ECA. So here on the slide you see the distribution of counterpart funds in the participating countries from 1948 to 53. And it shows that projects aiming on the transformation of nature were rather the rule than the exception. In total it was 38 billion US dollar from counterpart accounts that were given to the receiver by European governments from 1948 to 1953. And when we take a closer look on the distribution of the counterpart funds along the different sectors, then we see that around about a quarter was used for improving energy production and distribution, mostly thermal and hydropower, uh, thermal and hydropower plants, but also for refineries and building up electrical grids. The next in line is the transport and communi communication sector, with 20% of the counterpart funds. This was utilized for the construction of roads and railway systems, tunnels and bridges, to design a European-wide uh, European motorway network, but also to upscale capacities of sea and river ports and waterways. 16% was invested in a variety of agricultural projects such as, such as land reclamation, drainage, irrigation, fertilizer, fertilizer campaigns and the rationalization of agriculture by using machinery. And finally, with a 12% counterpart share, we have measures aimed at making the mining sector more efficient, such as mechanization of coal and ore, coal and ore extraction in order to improve the resource base of national economies and to reduce the dependencies on imports, but also it was used for the development of oil or natural gas fields in Europe. So I can't go into too much into detail at this point, but if we sum up the breakdown, uh, then we see the following thing. About three quarters of all counterpart investments between 1948 and 53 aimed at efficiency increasing projects in landscapes for economic purposes, or to put it in an environmental historical sense, to commodify nature in order to turn it into a resource for the reconstruction of European industrial production. So a third and last part, I would like now to discuss how the environmental historical potential of the Marshall Plan could be harnessed by using data and literature from the uh, debate of the Great Acceleration. So many of you are familiar with the graphs that are shown here. They come from the article The Anthropocene, Conceptual and Historical Perspectives, published by Will Steffen et al. in 2011. All of these charts show the now famous form of the hockey stick curves. Indeed, these graphs pre represent macro trends, and by doing so they are a bit problematic as they treat humanity as homogeneous. But what the authors are trying to show is that, and here I quote, the human enterprise switched gears after World War II. The change was so dramatic that the 1945 to 2000 and plus period has been called the Great Acceleration. So if we proceed a bit further in the text and examine how the authors explain the emergence of the Great Acceleration, we learn the following, and here I quote again from the paper. What finally triggered the Great Acceleration after the World War II, after the end of World War II? This war undoubtedly drove the final collapse of the remaining pre-industrial European institutions that contributed to the Depression and indeed the Great War itself. But many other factors also played an important role. New international institutions, the so-called Bretton Woods institutions, were formed to aid economic recovery and fuel renewed economic growth. Led by the USA, the world moved towards a system built around neoliberal economic principles characterized by more open trade and capital flows. The post-World War II economy integrated rapidly 
with growth rates reaching their highest values ever in the 1950 to 1973 period. Other factors also contributed to the Great Acceleration. The war produced a cadre of scientists and technologists, as well as a spectrum of new technologies, most of which depended, depended on the cheap energy provided by fossil fuels that could then be turned towards the civil economy. Partnerships among governments, industry and academia became more common, further driving innovation and growth. More and more public goods were converted into commodities and placed into a market economy. And the growth imperative rapidly became a core societal value that drove both the socioeconomic and the political spheres. Although I would say this quote only superficially sketches the changes that took place after 1945, there seems to be a certain overlap with the activities of the Marshall Plan. And some of you might wonder why parts of this quote are read. These, texts, these text parts give the readers a hint to one aspect of the Great Acceleration, which was up to date rather neglected, the actors that were involved, such as national and international institutions and organizations, governments, corporations, researchers and research institutes, politicians and so on. And the keyword actors also bring me now to my conclusions. So first of all, I would, just say, I would suggest that if, for, if historians want to turn the term great acceleration from a mere description of self-reinforcing processes into a concept which explains how and why these changes took place, we should not ask what triggered, but who drove the great acceleration. Such a move could help us to grasp political and economic power structures, as well as to identify winners and losers of the Great Acceleration in Europe. By doing so, environmental history could bring some meat on the barren rib of quantitative long-term trends. Because is it really the human enterprise which switched gears after World War II? Or is it above all industries, corporations and organizations such as the OEC that were driving the acceleration of resource flows after 1945 in order to increase profits, provide jobs and improve national income of European countries? I would rather argue the latter. But how does the Marshall Plan, uh, Marshall Plan come into play here? First of all, I would argue we should really abandon the view that the Marshall Plan was a reconstruction program. This may be true for the very first phase, but if we, take a, but if we look at it in a longer perspective, it becomes clear that its dominant target was not reconstruction, but economic expansion and with it acceleration resource utilization. At the same time, it's still largely unknown how this upscaling has exactly affected Europe. To give you but a few examples, I put a few questions together which I try to deal in on my project. So one question could be in which way and in which degree contributed the Marshall Plan to the increase of European resource consumption and with it the production of waste or pollution? Another question could be which role played the Marshall Plan for the widespread utilization of oil that played a minor role in European energy supply in the interwar period but became the dominant energy, energy source after 1950? And how big was the contribution of the Marshall Plan for the transformation of landscapes through land reclamation measures and drainage associated with losses in wetlands and biodiversity? We don't know it yet. To sum this up, it might be a methodological challenge to find out whether the Marshall Plan triggered the Great Acceleration or not, simply because nobody ever tried to systematically reconstruct the myriads of changes it funded from the bottom up. And at the same time, the sheer scale of interventions carried out during the Marshall Plan is its actual potential that makes it a useful lens on how exactly the conditions for the Great Acceleration of Western Europe were created after 1945. Thank you very much.